Um, you can't see my Winnie the Pooh shirt. Oh, I love Winnie the Pooh. Look at that. Winnie the Pooh. And there's Rabbit pushing the Aww. Isn't that cool? I love that. There is a rumor for a while that Winnie the Pooh was from Winnipeg. Okay. I don't think so. Pretty sure it was Wasn't like British. That's what I thought. But okay, any, anything Winnipeggers can do to make themselves seem like more famous than we already need to be is a thing. That's a, that's fair enough. And I, I can only say that because I'm from Winnipeg. Okay. And you're allowed. And I'm allowed to. So. How are you? I'm fine. There's a little bit of a thing here still. Yeah. But as soon as I do that, and I had PT today and I had her work on my neck because my neck still wasn't quite used to what we did. Yeah. And just so everybody knows, Kevin made the title when it isn't what you thought it was going to be. Because theoretically, the reason I flew to Livermore was to have you fix my shoulder. And that's because the MRI showed that literally every muscle tendon every tendon in my shoulder was shredded tendonitis did the tendinosis did tendinosis yeah like that yeah and but by the time I got there the tendons were all good and the, the motion like you watched me move my shoulder and the first thing you said was your clavicle's not moving clavicle What's that got to do with my shoulder? Oh, yeah. So then what could make my clavicle not move? Open heart surgery in 2007 and C-spine, five, six, six, seven in 2011. It was a busy four years. And that scarred down the clavicle. But in order to get the clavicle to move, do I get to do this or do you want to do this? I'll let, I'll do this part because I was the patient and I'm really too stoned to report, was too stoned to report most of it. In order to get the clavicle to move, we had to take the scar tissue out of the brachial plexus, out of the connective tissue and the nerves and the blood vessels, and ultimately scarring in the vagus because the vagus goes right down next to where the C-spine surgery was. And then I, all I remember, at, because it was, I was gone really, you said, yeah, and my fingers are basically knuckle deep into your trachea and esophagus. And once the vagus freed up, the clavicle started to move and the brachial plexus freed up, then that degenerated bone spurred AC, a chromio clavicular joint, the clavicular head hadn't moved in 15 years. So the joint was really entitled to be degenerated. And then that was the first day, right? Yeah. You were there. I was someplace else. Well, I was hanging on by a thread. I was astroplaning with you sometimes, but. And then you taped it, which was really fun. That was really cool. And then the net, uh, oh, and we also did the subscap that day. Yeah. That was the first day was the subscap. At which point I introduced you to the concept of not being quite so Canadian when it came to getting your thumbs into somebody's axilla. So your fingers got a little more bendy pointy. And so once the subscap was released and the clavicle moved, it's, ooh, this is really cool. Except my lower traps and the scapular motion was still like not happening. So that led to day two. And day two was peeling apart the lat from the serratus. And the other thing I remember guiding you through was that place where the lat, the serratus, and the subscap 
nerves all meet up at the lower portion of the axilla. And that was another don't be quite so Canadian moment. And then I don't remember much after that, except a, uh, being able to move. And that's when the biceps tendon had an opinion about what we did with my shoulder. Oh, and the pec minor yeah. and pec major, both yeah. were like hanging on. I think at one point you had four machines and 40 and 89, like afraid to move it. So the thing had been locked in place by all that scar tissue for 15 years. And so you can't coordinate movement if the limbic system says you are not going to move it. And I don't care how much power the cerebellum has. When the limbic system is talking to the cerebellum, the cerebellum says, yes, sir. So we turn down the limbic system, the 40 and 89, quieting the midbrain. And then we could get 40 and 84 to tell the cerebellum, look, just forget, get everything, forget everything that you thought you knew about what the shoulder's doing. And the cerebellum is going, excuse me, what? There's a problem with the shoulder? Really? I didn't, I don't remember. Okay. And then we did quiet the sensory cortex because it too had a memory of a shoulder that hasn't moved in properly in 15 years. And then we did increased secretions in the cerebellum at which point pretty much all of the muscles in the shoulder that should be firing started firing. Yeah. Is that two? Yeah. yeah. And then increased secretions in the sensory and motor cortex. And at that point, you also ran a bunch of 970s because of what's going on in my life. And then day three, oh, then we taped it and the biceps tendon had a, an opinion about, no, that was not the right thing to do. So Sunday we fixed that. And then there's no tape because we had me do those exercises. And now that's what I remember, except don't remember ever being as like all of a sudden I couldn't talk when you switch to a frequency. I teased patient teased, but you warn patients they're going to be a little bit stoned and it's legal in all 50 states. But to all of a sudden, in the middle of a word, it just go, right? Not. And then when you change, this is everything is connected to everything. Yeah. So when you change the way the lats fire, like the second day, do you remember that when I got up, I couldn't exactly walk? Yeah. I didn't, it was disequilibrium times three because the lats connect to the low back, connected to the pelvis, connect to the legs. And all of a sudden my low back was moving completely differently. It was so cool. And we only thought it was working on my shoulder. Oh yeah, we had to treat scarring the bursa. Okay, go. Oh. <laughs> so we know as practitioners that we're never going to treat what we think we're going to treat. That should always be in your subconscious that yes, this patient is coming in with a shoulder problem and I have the MRI report or I have the sore knee and the MRI report and I think I'm going to treat this stuff. And you do, you treat what you treated your torn and broken self for however long before you came to see me. And I'm sure that got you well ahead of the curve. It got the tissue in a really good place for like manual therapy and other frequencies and exercises and all the things. But I there's that. We could have, I don't think we could have done what we did if the tendons were still shredded. When you have partial thickness tears and absolutely 
every tendon in the shoulder. Totally. But yeah, so getting those fixed before I got to you, that's something people need to keep in mind too. If you have a tendinopathy or tendonitis, then you have to fix that before you can start taking apart scar to accept maybe the subscap in the shoulder. I don't know. Go. Maybe. But so having a custom care that your athletes have, if you're in my world where all my athletes really push them having it, even if it's not super specific to what they need, or it doesn't have the manual therapy component, it is something and it is something relevant and it is something helpful. So don't discount like the custom care and its protocols, because like you said, without it, I can't imagine the starting point I would have had. It would have been extremely difficult to get you from where you started to where we left on Sunday without that back treatment that you did. And back, I don't mean back, but like previous treatment. Previous. And at, well, every day you had a precision care for the manual component yeah. and custom cares yeah. all running. So there was one day where we ran 40 and 89 for almost an hour. Yeah. We, you can't expect, and I'll run 40 and 89 for a long time, especially in cases where the condition's been brewing for a long time, because I know what I'm about to do, how much range of motion I'm about to get from a patient. And I know what exercises I'm going to ask of that patient. So if when you're a therapist, you should have your treatment plan, treatment plan A in your head, but you also have treatment plan B and treatment plan C. And if things go cattywampus all the way down the alphabet and being able to pivot and switch around. But at some point you should always think I'm going to take apart something because I'm going to have to take apart something that's tight. And then I'm going to ask that joint to do something in very good mechanics that it probably has never done or hasn't done for a long time because of all the scarring or tightness or inhibition or whatever caused that muscle to shut down. And you can't expect that muscle to fire or its partners to fire or its neighbors to fire if it's scared. And if you're not running in 1489 at some part of that. And I love to run it in that sweet spot in the middle as I'm taking things apart and I'm just about to ask it to do something because I think it, it moves smoother. You don't, not once did you, when you were about to move your shoulder, did you have that look on your face? This is about to hurt. There is no anticipation of pain. There was that one time, I think it was Friday or Saturday where we went to move it and it glitched and it took you all of about a second to say oh yeah 40 and 89 at which point you just switch the custom care to 40 and 89 and it took it doesn't take long the no. limbic system catches on really fast yes. so it was okay just and that took 30 60 seconds and then i could move it without any but there was never a Oh my God. Or a patient non-compliant where sometimes you'll have patients that'll say, I can't do that before they've even tried. They have it in their head that there's just no chance that they're right. going to be able to do that. Even though actively or especially passively, you've yanked on the shoulder that the length is there. The tissue is healthy. You know that they can do it, but they just refuse to. Dialing it back to treatment on the first day, we thought it was going to be slam dunk, supine shoulder, blast apart the subscap. And I know I work slower than, and you're so funny, true to the instructor that you are, just, you're right there. Just, And that's why I love working on you and I love working on athletes because they have such good body awareness. It's not like the average person that's just, they're so hard to read and you have to really landmark and palpate. You're just like, no, go up a centimeter, go medial, inferior, press down. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so you were about, I was on like a three second delay from where your brain was. But at some point, and I actually posted this to Facebook where I had, we had all the books out because 
Yes. That was so cool. That was Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Because I just, I needed to see it and I know my shoulder anatomy. I'm very good at it, but you, sometimes you just need to have the visual right there on the patient's stomach as you're looking to troubleshoot. And I, as much as I know the shoulder, I didn't remember that tendon sheath over the bicipital tendon looking like that before. And so when you're able to manipulate and palpate and use the frequencies to help you with that, it turns into an, a different art altogether. Yeah, it's, and looking at the combination, I loved your anatomy coloring cards that you have in your file box left over from college or university and looking at the anatomy and then the nerves because you had the innervation you look at the scalenes where they attach to the first rib and the first rib was rolled up and it and then you look at the innervation and in order to get the scalenes to let go Five, six, and six, seven are fused, which means that four, five, and C7, T1 discs inevitably, unavoidably, are bulging and a little bit cranky. Therefore, those two nerves are going to be a little bit cranky, and all four segments are going to be adhered to the scalings. And therefore, where the clavicle and the first rib meet, that's going to be stuck. So looking at the anatomy between Netter, and at one point you were leaning over and had Netter on the cart, and I said, oh, for heaven's sakes, put it in my stomach. That was hilarious. And then you could see where you were headed and how things were put together. The shoulder is a ridiculous joint. Ridiculous. I wouldn't say impossible, but just seriously? No, it's a biomechanical marvel is what it is. And having Netter out on one of the pages that I typically wouldn't look at, it was more of a vascular page that we were looking at. And looking at all the vessels, looking at the nerve, and then rethinking what those muscular tendinous junctions look like. For instance, we were treating your rhomboids at one part, point and it's never your rhomboids. And I know it feels good when people like treat your rhomboids, but it's never your rhomboids. But they were messed up because of the way that they upwardly rotate the scapula. When you were doing abduction, it was all trap that was initiated, right? So you had this massive amount of elevation. The clavicle didn't rotate, it just elevated. And instead of the scapula, the if you look at the inferior angle, it should do this beautiful little like swoopy motion when you abduct. It went up in just oblique kind of line. And it was winging because pec minor was pulling on the coracoid, rotating you forward. So this is this last little piece of the puzzle that still soars because you were in this flexed internally rotated position with your glenohumeral joint because the scapula thoracic articulation was a complete disaster based on a lot of what was happening in here. Yeah, exactly. My, my second favorite, maybe, yeah, my second favorite was when you were trying to mobilize the glenohumeral joint and being osteopathically trained and Canadian, you were being so nice. And it's like, do me a favor, stand up, put the heel of your hand, no, move medial, take my humeral head and slide it posterior in the joint. Now, adduct my arm and slide it. And you could, I could feel the... I wouldn't say terror, but and fear of disaster when you actually slid the joint back where it belonged. And it's like it seated it in the socket and centered it in the labrum. Thank you, labrum. That would that was like, oh, thank you. That was so fun. 
That was so fun. And with FSM, it was so springy and healthy and compliant. And again, in a, in a joint that's been impeded and hampered with immobility. I guess the terror was real. I'm like, when is this going to blow apart? And she's going to just shut down. But you were just like, Woo-hoo! <laughs> and so was your shoulder. So it was crazy. But l- let's backtrack for a minute because we're making it seem really easy. And biomechanically, that would make sense, right? Oh, the GH joint, we have to look at the scapula thoracic. And for those of you, uh, so the Scapular humeral rhythm is really important. So for two degrees of abduction, that scapula has to upwardly rotate one degree. That's non-negotiable. Some books you'll see in Europe say three to one. So there's actually much more rotation with abduction. But that just tells you how important what's happening on the scapula is. And more cases than not, that's where the problem starts. The scapula stops moving for whatever reason. And in your case, I think a lot of it had to do with what was happening anteriorly with your neck and open heart surgeries. So you can expect, and as I'm working on, you have the scar and I'm like all over the place and I'm staring at the scar. And then you just blurt out, like they did crack my ribs open. And my ribs were like this at one point. I'm like, yeah. And how did I expect the pec minor and the subclavius to like be okay with that? What? And everybody needs to know that four times as much about the science and the biomechanics of how the shoulder is supposed to move. I know what muscles are connected to what. I don't have all of the mechanical. What you just said about the scapulas and abduct the scapula and abduction was okay, whatever she said. But to have that amount of knowledge and then have FSM to use as a tool to get you to proper function. And if the thing that's to me heartbreaking about people that don't use FSM is they think it's the muscle. They think it's the fascia. And it's, no, it's really not. It's adhesions in the nerve. The cerebellum does not notify you and it does not negotiate. So if you go to abduct, the cerebellum says, okay, I can get you to 180. It's going to be ugly. You don't want to know what's going on back there, but I can get you there. And it inhibits and amplifies whatever it has to do to get you to where you want to go to pick up the mug off the shelf and bring it down. It will do that. Yeah. But people, it's never the muscle. It's never the fascia. It's always adhesions in the nerve that inhibit motion and to get the motion normal to do what we did we were three hours a day for three days to do that without fsm would have taken a year and it would have hurt like a lot my my training in biomechanics is 100 percent my passion i have I use it more now with FSM than I did actually before because I have to think about what could be hindering that, that mechanic, what could be hindering that function. And it's not the muscle. So before FSM, it was really easy because it was just two situations. Something was inhibited or something was scarred. And yes, that's still the case, but now it's, what is holding it back? And that's where like netters comes into play or whatever anatomy software you want to look at, but it's what vessels are there? What nerve is there? If a nerve is running through it and a vessel is stuck and those two things are scarred, what's the best way to peel that apart? What innervates it? Where is it coming from? I have to go up higher now to chase it. So it's, you know, we use the term, it's playing whack-a-mole, but it's not playing whack-a-mole. It's strategically retracing your steps. It's like a CSI sort of episode. And do you remember after we finished taking apart the brachial plexus, down to my elbow, down to my hand, then you ended up doing the supine cervical practicum on my neck. And that just freaked you out I love that part it did because I went really fast with it and I typically when I do so I have a funny story when I was 
still in college and we were learning how to treat longus coli. And they taught us this was the last quarter before we graduated because treating the anterior neck is a thing. And I can't scary. imagine how scary it was before FSM. We were just going in. So I still find that I take a long time, like longus coli treatment. That's like a third date kind of thing. You're not doing that on your first date. But moving the trach over and slipping in, and we did it so fast, which was why it was so terrifying. And you were so stoned and comfortable with it, which was a whole other thing too, was just, yeah, it was. It's just scarring in the nerve. It collides and inflammation in the disc annulus, and that relaxes the muscle. And that lets you get at scarring in the nerve. And once you peel the nerve off the front of the longus coli and the scalenes, then they're free to move and contract normally instead of grabbing and the vagus because the vagus runs right down there too. Inflammation in the annulus is something I typically never did a ton of. I would do torn and broken a lot in the annulus, but inflammation running 40 and 710 was the big one. It, it let everything go from SCM, anterior, mid scalene. It all just turned to, I say snot, you say pudding, but it smushed. And then at one point we had floof and I can't remember what I was working on, but something so filled crazy. up and- The right. bursa was scarred under the delt and the supraspinatus. And then there's this huge bursa at the infraspinatus yes. where centuries all cross. There's a burst of the size of a hockey puck back there. And we did scarring. I think it was scarring in the bursa and then vitality in the bursa. Yeah. And that was floof. I think right? so. And it was funny because you were like floof. How do you spell that? F-O, F-L. I'm like, I don't know. Oof, whatever. It's floof. We were both like so far gone. Oh, so funny. But it was a real song and dance of pulling apart scar tissue, mobilizing the joint, treating the nervous system, thinking about the cause, like how did it get there? So it, yes, we treated the muscle. Yes, we treated the fascia. Yes, we treated the joint and the joint surface and the bursa. Yes, we treated all those things that we know we had to treat. But if we didn't treat the disc, if we didn't treat the vagus, if we didn't treat brain the brain the, nothing would have responded as fast as it did and nothing would have held as fast as well as it did over those three days now if you're a practitioner like me that gets people from out of state coming in and you only have two days you don't have the luxury of having them come back where they started or heaven forbid worse because you have to build on the momentum that you had from the treatment before. So that's always in the back of my mind. Okay, after treatment one, whatever I'm doing, it has to be safe enough that you're not, your phrase, I just don't want to make you worse. And if I make you better, great. And if that, those results stayed from day one to day two, that's my goal. And I think every night, despite the taping from day two to day three, we're just really irritated that bicipital groove and anterior delt, but we had made enough progress and we got the mid trap and lot firing in a safe enough pattern that why tape you up and piss it off even more. So leaving on a high note too. Well, and you also, it's just one, it's just torn and broken in the round tendon and inflammation in the periosteum, I think. Right. In the front, because it was where the bicipital tendon and the retinaculum and the periosteum went from being locked down and scarred to elongated. And you want me to do what? Totally. So the biceps hasn't fired because the thing I couldn't do on day two was lay on my back and lift my arm. Right. Straight up. And whatever that's called. Just flexion. And yeah, flexion. Couldn't do it. The biceps went black. And by day three, it was really annoyed because we taped it back. But then that was the first thing you fixed. 
So the other nice thing about the way we think about using FSM is when something goes wrong, it's not a disaster, it's just information. Totally. Oh, poor little biceps tendon, <laughs> poor thing here. So we just gave it a little 124, fixed the little strain, and then treated the periosteum around it for scarring, inflammation, and I think calcium deposits. Yes. Like ground glass in the periosteum. And then all of a sudden, I could then the lower trap, the serratus, the rhomboids, the lats, everybody could fire. And I could lift my arm as completely pain-free. So when you make, and for everybody that's listening, you will inevitably make something worse in the process of fixing something as complicated as the shoulder or the knee. It's just, it's got just, it's going to happen. So it's not a disaster. Don't be afraid. And for heaven's sakes, don't apologize. No. Oh, that makes total sense. And the patient goes, excuse me? No, it makes total sense. Look at what we did. Oh, poor thing. Here, let me fix it. And it takes what? It took 10, 20 minutes to quiet down the biceps, at which point the whole shoulder rolled back. It's, it's just information. That's right. I think if you're ever going to make somebody worse with the musculoskeletal whatever treatment, it's going to be the shoulder because of just the structure of the shoulder. So many times early on in my FSM mileage, I'll never forget that one patient that was a five out of 10 and I got him down to about a one, maybe a two out of 10 when he left. Thank you, charting notes. The next morning was in the clinic, wanted to see my head on a platter because he had eight to nine out of 10 paint. It had gone up exponentially. And our receptionist was like, oh my God, I'm sorry. I'm, and, and I'm like, did you say your shoulder was a nine out of 10? And he's yeah, you're smiling about that. I'm like, yes, because you need imaging because there's a tear there. And we're gonna get we're gonna get this sorted out and it's gonna be great. So yay, we figured it out. And he's like, okay, yay. <laughs> and then, but that was just talking him off the ledge. But you had explained this. I think it was at an advanced or it was at one of the cores, and it made total sense to me. If you've got you look at the rotator cuff and the only way the humeral head is sitting where it is based on four muscles making this, this team seven more than yes, but nine. your prime rotator cuffs are your four, but there's going to be scarring. If something is torn and somebody else is taking up the slack and their scar tissue that is creating stability because a ligament was supposed to be or a tendon or another muscle. It just makes sense that you would throw off the mechanics, really anger those pain generators. Those nociceptors are going to go through the roof, but it's at how you as a practitioner deal with it. So whether it's the shoulder or setting somebody else's symptoms off, you make a point of charting. If you're going to chart anything in your chart, it is pain coming in and pain coming out because when you do make them worse and you will, you have that at least to go back on and say, oh, okay, hang on, let me see. Because when you left, you were a two. Remember you came in as an eight and you left as a two? And then they're like, oh yeah. And then okay. either, and yeah, they forgot. And either they felt so good, they overdid it when they got home, took apart their couch and vacuumed everything and put all their soup cans back in their cupboard. So that's a big point. We didn't do that with you because we just, you had so much awareness and everything, but the second point I want to make, and I know we're talking a lot about your shoulder right now, but it was, and there's so many talking points about what we did over the weekend. I do use rock tape and train with kinesio, kinesio tape is where I took all my courses from. I believe in it because it pro can provide structure and stability and recruitment when a joint isn't ready to do it naturally. And we did it with you and it wasn't necessary on the third day because we got the recruitment 
naturally and organically. And you, I have given you exercises and you will do these and we'll continue to build. But I feel like it can be a very useful tool in those, especially with muscles like mid trap and low trap, like your lower traps were like hibernating. Yeah, they were totally gone. Because and, your, your lat was like, I've got it all. And your tra upper traps were like, me too. So your upper traps and your lats were taking, can, were hijacking like all the other muscles in your back. And I came to love, as opposed to sneer at kinesio tape, that, yeah. that the first day, especially when we were in that, as you would call a sweet spot, it's like we were, the muscles were, really, I could, I, this is what? And you just put the tape on and I can remember telling you, it's no, I need more there. And then you put a bigger strip, I think for the lat or the lower track. And yeah, now I have to find a course because I have no clue about how to use kinesio tape. So now that's on my to-do list, but yeah, the reason we're talking so much about my shoulder, it's like anybody's shoulder. It's shoulders are the most complex joint in the body, I think. It's like the knee is maybe is second. And the things that go wrong with the knee have to do with the adductors, the piriformis, and the ankle, and the pronation of the foot. So it's the tibia, the femoral, right? So the knee is complicated because most of the time it's not the knee, but that's another conversation. But the shoulder is so, it's intimidating, especially to those of you that don't, that aren't biomechanically trained. I'm a chiropractor, you're an osteopath effectively. Osteopathically trained massage therapist, I think you called it. And we have an appreciation for the complexities of shoulder motion, innervation. And I do a lot with that in the core that's an introduction. And you can leave breadcrumbs for people to follow. And then say, oh, maybe I can learn more about the shoulder. Okay. If all you do is take apart the subscap and the lat, you're ahead of the game. Yes. And then, sort of. try and then try and know what Kim knows. No, I don't think that's too hard. It's I just, <laughs> it's like anything that when you love treating it and you love learning about it, you want to just immerse yourself in it and learn everything else you can about it. And to me, biomechanics was the one thing in my education that just made sense to me. It all had a reason. There was a rule and not everybody had to follow it. We don't care. I don't ever measure anybody and say that, oh, this should be this. I look for symmetry. I look for balance. I look for relative function. I always want somebody to move better, pain-free, but looking at your clavicles, like someone goes, how was your day? Oh, you should have seen what this clavicle did. Excuse what? me. <laughs> But just seeing the upward rotation with breath and with abduction, you're just like, yes. That was a day well spent. Yeah. So cool. I have more talking points, but we have a lot of questions that Ooh. comments. I don't know what we should open first. We'll open up the Q&A maybe. Let me do Cynthia first. You've been asked to work on a 12-year-old lab who had a back leg amputated use wet towels. Labs don't have a lot of really long fur. It's not like a German Shepherd or a Bernese Mountain Dog. You just wrap around the stump and it's the first thing you treat on anybody with an amputated leg is 40 and 89. It's, I think, in humans anyway, it's, what do you call it? Phantom limb pain is the biggest thing, but oh yeah, absolutely. Hey Leaf. Oh, Cynthia gets a precision care. I'm so excited. Recipe for Bell's palsy. Recipes go. You do better going off on recipes than I do. There are no recipes. You Thank have you. to think, first of all, what is wrong and where is it occurring? So don't memorize a list of frequencies because it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Is that Canadian and, enough? 
Yeah, that's very good. I like that. And Bell's policy is usually viral. Right. So I would lead with 160, which is malignant virus from the advanced. And the Bell's palsy is the facial nerve because it's motor. And the facial nerve comes out of the pons, not the medulla. So the medulla stops pretty much at nine and eight, seven, six, five come out of the pons. So 396 is the nerve that's out on the face. And you basically put the positive contacts around the neck and behind the ear and the negative contact out in the middle of the face and down the front of the neck. So Bell's palsy, you're going to have paralysis in the platysma and that's the easiest to get back. So you treat the virus, you treat inflammation, then you increase secretions in the nerve because out here it's 396, right? The virus is in the pons and that's 454, I think. So the virus is in the pons and in the nerve. So the platysma is easiest for some reason. The eye is the hardest and the orbit getting somebody to whistle. That's the orbital orbicularis oris. That has always been the hardest and the eye, getting the eye to close. So that's 81 and 396 once you've taken care of the, the, uh, the pathologies. Right. So again, to build on the anti-recipe, if you were to just think, oh, Bell's palsy, it's motor paralysis to the face, increased secretions to the nerve, you'd be done. No, because it didn't just stop working from space. What, what, why? So we go back, we try with everything to go back as far as possible to what the onset could have been. So take it, as you would say, or Roger Bellica said, I think, take out the bad stuff put in the good stuff. So the bad stuff would be the virus that started the trouble and attack the poor nerve. And then put in the good stuff, take out the trauma, poor baby, and reduce inflammation because the nerve responds to infection and trauma with inflammation. And that destabilizes the nerve membrane. So you remove the inflammation. When you think about it, it's really logical. Take out the bad stuff. That's the virus that started the trouble. Then what does the virus cause? Trauma and inflammation. And then how do you get the nerve to fire again? Increase secretions in the nerve, not the pons, because the pons has a bunch of complex cranial nerves that come out of the pons. Increasing secretions in the pons, I have a great respect for because I treated somebody with a pons stroke and that taught me a lot about the pons. So just increase secretions in the nerve. Right. You think your way through it and that's the recipe. Without using the word recipe ever. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Oh, okay. wow. The chat. Okay. All right. Debbie. Oh, the chat. It. Yeah. Exactly. We treat what we know from the information we are given from the client. They go home feeling great, come back with pain. Not as much as they had, but they had pain. My shoulder client was like that. And I loomed at the erector spine, bullseye, sorry, looked. He had two injections in the shoulder. Finally, great to finally be awake to listen to Carol and Kim. <laughs> Glad you're having fun, Debbie. Hey, John. Infection in the ear. A leaking ear. Okay. Leaking ear. Client reported next day, no pain, no leaking. Far out. Debbie. FSM has opened up biotensegrity for me, allowing my mind to think about where the problem is coming from. Yes, get the frequencies and it's my hands on therapy 
takes a back room exactly and I get to meet John Sharkey in London and then I go to Dublin and to tell a fashionista that the fascia is enervated may involve duct tape I, or demonstration or something. It's, it's, I, thank you, Debbie. I never treat the fascia except for vitality at the end, which makes it fluffy. Yeah. 40 and 10, 124 and 77, four machines. I know just the shoulder because I would add pelvis into it because of tensegrity. Exactly. You should have seen me trying to walk after you treated my lats. My I had no idea where I was in space. Both the low traps and the lats have attachments down there. They don't just hang after their attachments on the shoulder. Like they have to connect somewhere. So it only would make sense that you were so cute sitting on the table. And for those of you who are listening on the podcast, I'll try to verbally explain it. After pulling apart your neck, like you were just sitting there with your, your head to the left. I'm like, hey, look straight. You're like, I am. I'm like, no. <laughs> 30 degrees left rotated and it felt like that was neutral. <laughs> but then trying to walk, it, because of the attachments of the lower trap and the lats, especially into the low back. So if we had me local and I am going to fly down and have you work on my poor little left shoulder, but that's another conversation. But if you had me local I would book an appointment for one to two weeks and we'd take apart my low back check on the shoulder actually probably first work on the left shoulder so both sides of my low back would be equally stupid at the same time and then work on the low back and the cerebral hilarious and that only makes sense did we get leaf okay well, yeah let's go through the rest of the q a here Leaf had an ankle sprain, which was two weeks ago, and he went golfing yesterday. Aww. Yay! Golfing is good. What a joy to be here. Thank you. Dealt with CFS for almost a year and back on my feet now. Love to give FSM Woo-hoo. a chance to help me heal completely. I live in France. Bonjour. And there was not a practitioner nearby. I'd love to do it myself. Would it be possible? Where do I start? Sure. Come to London. I was thinking I was going to have a whole month off. For those of you that don't know, George passed away May 9th and my son passed away July 21st. And so it's all oh, London has got seven people, four people signed up. I'm going to take that whole month off. Then Kevin checked the signups and there's 17 or 20 signed up for London. So I'm going to London September 4th. It's going to be great. And, uh, and then we're going over to Ireland and then I'm Kevin's coming home and then I'm going to Germany to do some stuff there. But I don't know where you're in France. It's what, the 30 minute flight from wherever you are. There is one physical therapist in France whose name escapes me, but he came and did that brilliant case of thoracic outlet that he fixed. She was surgical. They were, and you know what they do for thoracic outlet for surgery, just scary. And he, the case report that he presented, I think in 17 or 19, was 17 was repairing thoracic outlet that was surgical in eight weeks and it's national health in France. So 30 minute sessions, eight weeks, I think he has two machines and it was done completely pain-free, normal sensation, complete normal function. Do you remember his name? What was his name? Guillaume? I can't remember. Anyway, there's one practitioner in France. I think he's in Bordeaux, I think. Anyway, but the simplest thing is just come to London and take the course. Still not traveling. Oh, Germany is just going to be for the Meg Healy in in Potsdam. So that's not going to be this. Oh. Okay, it's not the right time or place. Your email, 
Yeah, simplest thing is to email contact at frequency specific. You can take the course on video. I think that course is yeah, I, this I, year. I actually had yeah, I emailed him. Okay, good. Kevin already emailed you. And then Cynthia, Bell's palsy was post-vaccine. Then you use, in addition to 160, you use the whole COVID viral sequence. There's six of them. 40, 38, 41, 44, 189, 160, and what's that one? 40, 50, 56. So the thing to remember about this list of frequencies that we got from a machine that was built in 1922 is there was the pandemic in 1919, but prior to that in 14, 14, 17, and 18, there were epidemics that were fairly localized before it went, before it exploded like COVID. And so on the list that I got from 1922, there's seven frequencies for flu, respiratory flu, malignant flu, London flu, respiratory flu. Blah, blah, blah. So you'd use all four of those on the pons and on, on the nerve. And that's, that's long COVID is almost always that sequence on the affected tissue and on the vagus. So far, it's never, knock on wood, it's never, hasn't worked. Long COVID's just not that hard. And I can't believe that just came out of my mouth. I was just going to say that. It just, it's, I don't know. It just hasn't ever not worked. I keep waiting for it to not work. I don't expect anything to be a hundred percent, but it's when you can get somebody's sense of smell back in 30 minutes by treating the capillaries and the ethmoid sinus with those six frequencies and the vagus. Oh. Okay. I didn't believe it was going to work. I said, ah, oh, this is not going to work. And then it did. And then it keeps working. Yeah. I think we got all of the questions. I want to write. We answered everything. Wow. We have time left. Oh, only six minutes. We do. We have more to, more about the shoulder that we have to talk about. But okay. one thing that just occurred to me because we're talking about all this amazing like biomechanical knowledge and anatomy knowledge you can start very simply with having somebody just sit up straight and relax their shoulders it doesn't have to be complex so you just left but because relaxing my shoulder was like this and you said your upper trap is tight and i said it no it's not it's fine no so that's just where I want to simplify it for a second because everybody's upper traps are overworked because we have developed into a society where we are sitting and we are flexed forward and we are sitting on our phones all the time. So our upper traps have to be activated because we shouldn't be in this position. And your mid traps and your lower traps are checked out because they're chronically elongated and they're stretched. And when a tissue is stretched, what happens? You get micro tears in it. So that was one reason why 124, in my opinion, you should have on your custom care. Not everybody has six precision cares in their clinic like you do. Most of us have one precision care and a whole army of custom cares floating around. But it's really easy to just put these one liners on there the way we did with you. So 40 and 89, should be a one-liner. 124 and tissue. 77. 77 should be on there. 13 and 396 should or just be. And 396. Exactly. And 89. Right. It takes no time at all if you don't have it under custom care to just make a one-liner and throw it on there. So I think the value of it is huge because you can treat so many things in an hour as opposed to stretching it out for three hours and then just watching the patient go from this to 
And then one thing, one little nugget that I want to add, my invaluable exercise rehab is superhero pose. Yes. Because anybody can do it and it works for almost any condition because it activates the entire posterior chain and it builds confidence. So superhero pose is exactly what it sounds like. You, I will demo it, but people who are listening, you're going to stand up. You're going to put your hands on your hips. You're going to stand with your feet hip width apart. You're going to project your heart up to the corner of the room and stand with your head up like you would if you were a superhero just about to save the day. And just in that position, your lower traps activate, the erector spinae activates, everything in the chest has a chance to open up. And so sometimes I'll just have patients stand in superhero with 40 and 89 running. And they can hold a washcloth in each hand, or they can stand on it and put one around their neck, and then it goes right through them. And the confidence that it builds having their posterior chain activated safely going sending that feedback up to the brain that this is good can be a real game changer so that was my extra little nugget i wanted to add and i'm not and there's and it's not just the posterior chain correct it, it's a position that reflects confidence enthusiasm fearlessness and to run 40 and 89 while you're doing that and 970 and 27. So removing fear and fear always starts in the midbrain. So you quiet down the midbrain and then 970 and 27. And it's just, it makes such a huge difference. It's really a brilliant strategy. It's the therapist in me is going, oh yeah, that's a really great idea. There's been so many studies just on superhero pose before people do public speaking, before they go into job interviews, because it really does just increase confidence. And if there's one feeling I want my patient leaving the room is confidence in the process. Everybody hears it from me in my very polite Canadian verbiage that not everything is a slam dunk or a one and done and it's buildable. I think that's a great way to leave people and have people practice that at home. That's something that's easy to do. This is not like we're asking them to buy a Peloton or a TRX device. Like everybody can stand. Yeah. And when you, I can remember back when I first started doing this in 96, 97, 98, when the clinic was total chaos and I went from 45 patients a week to 90 patients a week in three months, like in no, in six, two months in 60 days, it was insane. And I had no idea what I was doing. Like I was making it up. I was running hours late. And I can remember standing outside the treatment room with the treatment room door closed and taking my hands, looking up and taking my hands and doing this. And it's okay. Let's do this thing. And that's, that's what you do every time. That's right. And it's all internal. <laughs> so my quote is not a quote. It's a reminder of my favorite acronym of the word FAIL, which stands for F-A-I-L, which is your first attempt in learning. Yeah. So going back to the, somebody got worse or something, never apologize. You didn't fail at it. This was your first attempt in treating a patient that is probably very complex, that has been treated probably already many times. And this was your first hypothesis that didn't work out the way you thought it would, but you're going to adapt and adjust and change the trajectory that way. And there's an addition to that, and that is, the only difference between the expert and the novice is that the expert has failed more times than the novice has even tried. So every course seminar, that phrase comes out of my mouth. It is not possible for any of you to fail as many times as I have. So the core at this point is the breadcrumbs, is I warn you about the mistakes that you can make because I already made them. 
Now you're going to make ones of your own because some things are really complicated. But one of the reasons the core has become five days instead of two and a half is that I've included all of, oh, by the way, this needs to be done because of that. And that needs to be done. And in case you see this, that's why that happened. And it's not really a failure. It's information. It tells you right. something. Yeah. And what it tells you is important. So you double somebody's range of motion in their neck and they come back the next day or two days later and they say, my neck is so much worse. Where is it? Here, draw it. So it's so much worse. Their pain level is still exactly the same. It's still a four or five, but it's at one joint and they mind it more because it was gone. So it's those kinds of things just come with mileage. Yeah. And so dive in, do your thing, get better, do good things. Yes. Is it really and, time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Five I was gonna say, and all those things. And join us next week <laughs> for another episode. <laughs> We have way too much fun. Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure that's possible. Bye. See you. See ya. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.